And we're off. <sighs> I'm treading lightly. My toes are kind of hurting. Slightly more pumped than I would have liked. Which is one of the classic ways to yourself when you're soloing. When you're on a quest to redefine what's humanly possible, the line between triumph and tragedy is razor thin. I'm Jimmy Chin. From Mount Everest to Antarctica, I've had the privilege of sharing adventures alongside the world's most daring athletes. In the pivotal moments, when life hangs in the balance, what drives the greatest to keep pushing, to stare down fear, to risk everything? These are the stories from the edge of the unknown. To be on the side of a cliff without a rope, totally untethered, you know, free, feels pretty freaking next level. Free soloing is the ultimate test of climbing. That's when it's all on the line. And that's the challenge of doing something that hasn't been done before, is how do you know that you're ready? I've known Alex Honnold for years. He's climbed the biggest walls on the planet without a rope, pushing the limits of what's possible. I was there when he free soloed the 3,000 foot El Capitan in Yosemite Valley, California. This was a climb so futuristic and visionary that not even the top climbers in the world were daring to think about it. How does someone prepare to do the impossible? I had been dreaming of free soloing El Cap forever. The psychological challenge felt so vast. And if you feel really scared thinking about it, then you're, you're probably not prepared enough. I felt that Morocco would be a perfect practice ground to get one step closer to free soloing El Cap. Morocco, it's off the map. No one would know about it. This was a place where he could test himself, both physically and mentally, with a massive amount of climbing. And then he wanted to free solo one of the big walls at the end of the trip. He knew that the route that he'd chosen would be one of the greatest big wall free solos in history. I can't wait to sign all this stuff. I'm so curious if we can actually make these walls feel smaller, you know? Yeah. <laughs> There's baby goats halfway up the first pitch. That's really cute. <laughs> Tommy was really the only possible partner for the training that I was hoping to do in Morocco. We always like to climb with somebody who climbs so fast. It's so amazing. Tommy is one of the best climbers in the world. When I started climbing, he was already a hero in the climbing world, and I looked up to him my entire life. I think Alex and I just felt like if we got together and climbed, we could do stuff that we couldn't do on our own. And from there, it evolved into this very close friendship. We're only gonna bring five lines and so knowing that he had this giant objective, my role just became to help him survive, essentially. Yeah, it was one of the ones that you left all your Tommy didn't want Alex to free solo, but he knew that Alex was going to go do it anyways. So Tommy decides that the best way that he can support his friend is to train with him. Doing something that dangerous is really about having full confidence that you will be successful. Alex wanted to push himself with a huge endurance challenge, a triple link up, to climb three of the biggest walls in Tajia with Tommy in one day. It would be the equivalent of running three back-to-back -back marathons at a world record pace. So what's your guess on time? 22 hours. 22. 
I think like 5 a.m. top out, so that means that we'd be doing 21 hour link up. That's my prediction. All right, let's see who's closest. Okay, lap, good to go. These big walls are extraordinarily technical. This is 512, 513 terrain, a rating of difficulty that really only a world-class climber can climb. I remember sort of not really loving this pitch. I don't remember this pitch hardly at all. Finger slip, but it was a hard move. The hardest move on the route. I knew Alex was going to free solo one of the routes. We were climbing together, thinking about being up there and that high off the ground without a rope. That's a terrifying thought. There we go. Hey, dude. So fun climbing like that. Pretty solid. We did six and a half. It's pretty sick to think that Tommy's about to climb all the way past the shade up there in this first block. <laughs> like, look how freaking far that is. Ooh, skin's a little more tender than the last week. It's much harder to climb sharp limestone in full sunlight. Your fingers are sweating more, which makes your skin softer which makes the rock cut your skin more. We had to climb very delicately. Make sure we grabbed these razor sharp holds and pulled on them as little as possible. And you're also trying to stand on these tiny little edges, very precise, small movements with your feet. The rubber gets really hot and it basically cooks your feet. It's just hard to cover these guys because basically they're the fastest guys in the world on this terrain. You're saying you might have worn out the film crew. Well, now you, don't have you, might, you might get a day without a film crew then. That'd be awesome. Okay, let's go climb another mountain. Oh yeah, Some more. The sun going away is a welcome reprieve, where you're like, oh, thank God we're not getting cooked anymore. But the hard part in the dark is navigating. You never quite know if you're going the right direction. I'm told my foot is totally numb right here. That's what, dude, that's what I was saying. Oh, I really want this route to go easily and quickly. <laughs> yeah. All right, dude. Ready for the next lap, huh? When you're pretty exhausted and it's dark, it's easy to start making some mistakes. Hey guys, I see them. They're already like up there. We were many, many hours into a link up. It was dark and we were quite tired. Your headlamp illuminates like a 10-foot bubble around you. So that's your entire world, and you just exist in that 10-foot bubble. In some ways, that can actually be sort of centering. But you still have to be able to find the route. Man. Oh, ah, oh, man. I'm getting the like release in my feet. I have to get it off my shoes. That was a lot of rock climbing. Mm. I concur. At the end of the triple, we were both exhausted. And then I was planning on spending one more week so that I could do a big solo project. I don't free solo at all. This is what it is. I'm willing to do things that I might like end up, you know, pretty maimed, but I really, really try and stay away from things that where I'm just gonna totally splat. It's pretty like 
thin distinction. <laughs> it's all very loose. Yeah. <laughs> but I absolutely understand the appeal of it. Like emotionally, that's how I feel. Logically, I'm like, I should never do that. Yeah, maybe you gotta just go with the emotion sometime and just go do it. <laughs> Those are the things where I'm like, as a father, I can't do that. You know, it's gotta be logic, not emotion. You think? Yeah. Looking back on Morocco, there's just this level of angst and turmoil. I felt like I should be training harder, I should be climbing more, I should be doing more, you know, because I had this huge goal in front of me and I was just like, I just didn't know if I was ready and felt like I should be doing more, doing more. My next challenge was to free solo Riviera Pupre. To a layperson, they look at a big wall and they're like, that looks insane. And they assume that I just walk up to a cliff and just climb it with no, you know, planning, no path, no, no anything. But the reality is it couldn't be further from the truth. A lot of people think Alex is a free soloist. He must throw risk to the wind. He doesn't care. But actually, he's one of the most calculated people I know. Everything that he does, it's so methodical and intentional. How long have you been on? How long am I going to be on the mountain? Mm -hmm. I don't know, hopefully less than four hours. Oh, really? OK. Mm -hmm. So like on the 1500 foot route, they're basically like 40 feet of climbing scattered throughout different sections that I want to figure out. OK. Watching Alex prepare is hugely inspiring. He's meticulous about how he approaches it. It's about the climbing, and it's about managing the fear. It's about struggling with doubt to do something that's never been done before. It's not always obvious which parts will be easy or hard when you take the rope away. So I practice the route with a little bit more intentional mind towards the free solo. Just spend some time thinking about what will actually be scary or not. The crux pitch of Revere Pupre was the hardest part. It's about a thousand feet off the ground. And when I had first climbed this route, I had fallen off that pitch. But it's pretty steep, kind of small holes and big reaches. I was concerned about that pitch. Le Riviere Pupre in Morocco would be considered one of the greatest free solos in history. And I think when you have a superpower, it's really hard not to use it. But it was heavy. The route requires precision climbing. One mistake, and he dies. I remember Alex and Tommy saying goodbye to each other. And I could see it in, in Tommy's face. The hug might have been a little bit longer, and you know, it's one of those goodbyes that was knowing that, you know, Tommy might never see Alex again. It doesn't feel good to make your friends and family worry about you, which is why most of my free soloing is normally in private, so that you don't put that burden on anybody else. It felt very different than most free solos cameras made it slightly harder, but I also knew that was a good way to prepare myself for harder things down the road. Shooting a big wall free solo was terrifying. You know, we spent days rigging on the route, trying to imagine someone climbing it without a rope. It made us very nervous. I definitely feel fear. I mean, if I didn't feel fear, I wouldn't have to do all the prep work. I would just go up and do the route. The correct way to manage fear, I think, is to gradually broaden your comfort zone until your comfort zone includes things that seemed previously impossible. I'm treading lightly. Some climbers remember like every movement of every route. I'm definitely not gifted like that. I knew the hardest parts pretty well, but the rest of it was all a bit of a question mark. Slightly more pumped than I would have liked. A 
lot of the lower climbing. I was thinking about it as I did it. Like, do I grab this one, or is this secure? Is it that foot, or this other foot? Should I try a different foot? I got my finger stuck in one of the pockets, which is one of the classic ways to yourself when you're soloing. In retrospect, maybe I could have given it another day or two of prep work. I'm slightly over gripping, like I'm holding on too tightly, which is why my feet are sort of tense when I move them. I don't place them smoothly and quietly. I'm like moving sort of helter skelter. Do you hear that? It's off to the left. It sounds exactly like someone is yelling Alex over and over. There are like climbers behind me, highliners on the other side. So I can sand up here. Normally when you're free soloing, you're totally alone in some incredible environment. But as I was free soloing, I kept hearing this weird yelling. It was just this crazy French guy dangling from a tightrope in the middle of the canyon. And he kept yelling at himself like, allez, allez. <laughs> oh, the guy just whipped. Holy <laughs> Huh. And then he would fall off and then he would bounce on the rope and then he'd try to get back up and then he'd fall off. And I remember that it made the whole thing feel a little bit more like a circus. In this case, I mean, with most climbers with ropes, the whole point is to fail over and over and over until you eventually succeed in something. Uh, but, you know, with free soloing projects, that's totally off the table. You have to make sure you never fail and just do the thing that you're trying to do first try. Just got to climb one more pitch. When I get into the difficult climbing, like it doesn't matter what's going on around me, I'm just climbing. Which really is part of the appeal of free soloing, you know, is that level of focus. The crux pitch of Riviera Propre is just this overhanging panel up high on the wall. more fatiguing than the other pitches because the angle kicks back. And because it's steep, fatigue builds as you climb it. Your arms start to get quite tired as you go. But that's why Tommy and I had done the triple ahead of time to prepare it. I knew that my fitness was high enough that it wouldn't matter that the hard part was at the top. Yeah. I got myself like a like a B minus, like an eight out of ten, I guess. So it wasn't your funnest song. No. No. But you know, that's just part of it. Sometimes you just gotta be able to perform. I remember thinking he looked noticeably disappointed. He wasn't happy with the fact that he felt scared on the route and he felt jittery, not smooth. And he knew that that would not work on El Cap. But getting used to having a film crew shooting him on a long climb like that helped prepare his mindset for when we were shooting on El Cap. Well. Shall we do another one? He's got he the post-solo glow. He does. <laughs> Whatever you could say about today, you definitely still have the post-solo glow. You did just climb a 512 thick wall without a rope. Compared to El Cap, the preparation that I put in for Riviera Pupre was pretty minimal. You know, I climbed it a couple times and then I did one day of direct preparation. Whereas with El Cap, I spent 18 months or so practicing for the solo. When I left Morocco, I was in the, the best shape of my life. I'd just done each of the hard challenges that I'd set for myself, so like confidence was high. I mean, I was showing up in Yosemite in the best possible shape. Oh, 
He's moving fast. I mean, that's like one of the most exposed moves like anyone El Cap. Alex is having the best day of his life. <sighs> oh, 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 God. Wow. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh my God, I can't believe what I just witnessed. <laughs> oh God. You just, yeah. oh. 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 Good to see you again. Alex's free solo of El Cap will go down as the greatest rock climbing accomplishment in history. What a journey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this was a generation defining climb. The moon landing of climbing. The reality is that I likely will never work on anything to that scale again, just because I don't know if any specific climb will ever mean as much to me as, as El Cap did. Whether or not that will eventually translate into not soloing as much, I don't know, I don't know. We'll see if I even want to, because I've soloed a lot. <laughs> like, I've soloed like, almost anything I care about. Alex's ability to manage fear and to free solo the biggest walls in the world is truly remarkable. But what inspires me the most is the intention and purpose that he brings to his life. He pushes us to all ask ourselves, are we living the life that we want to live? When you're standing beneath a big wall and you're about to climb it without a rope, it's hard to match that kind of intensity. Something tells me parenting will be a much bigger and more meaningful experience long-term. But hopefully it's not gonna be quite as scary. <laughs>